Cells are the fundamental unit of life, and they can be found in any environment imaginable across the natural world. There are many different types of cells, each with their own biological niche, and it can be complicated to artificially reproduce these growth conditions inside flasks or test tubes. Hello, I'm Jack Wang, a microbiologist and science educator, and this is part three in our series on cell and tissue culture. Parts one and two in this series highlighted the basic principles of mammalian cell culture. You can find the links in the description below. And in part three, we will walk you through bacterial cell culture, as well as cell counting assays that can be used for different cell types. Compared to their eukaryotic counterparts, bacterial cells have much greater metabolic diversity, which allows them to grow in different conditions at a much faster rate. In the laboratory, we can culture bacteria using a variety of different nutrient media, which can be liquid broth, as well as solid agar. Solid agar allows us to visualize individual bacterial colonies, which has clear benefits for estimating cell concentration. Nutrient media for bacterial cultures is usually much cheaper than media for mammalian cell culture. Depending on the cell type you're comparing, it can be up to 100 times cheaper to grow an equivalent concentration of bacterial cells compared to mammalian cells. Just like mammalian cells are stored long term at minus 80 degrees Celsius, bacterial cells can be frozen down as well. This process is not healthy for the cells though, as the liquid medium will form ice crystals that can puncture the cell membranes as it freezes. Chemical cryoprotectants can raise the freezing point of the liquid to slow down the overall freezing process and be gentler on the cells. DMSO is commonly used for freezing down mammalian cells and glycerol is very common for bacterial stocks. Once frozen down, these cells can remain dormant until the scientist resuscitates them for experiments. You saw in parts one and two that we always try to work with mammalian cells in a tissue culture hood with laminar airflow. The same can be said for bacterial cells, especially if they are rare strains or genetic mutants that you have just isolated. They are prone to infection and contamination from other bacteria, viruses, or fungi just like mammalian cells, but they are not quite as vulnerable. Your mileage may vary, but it is common to work with bacterial cultures around a Bunsen burner flame rather than in a tissue culture hood exclusively all the time. Here we're working with E. coli from an existing flask growing in liquid broth culture. The idea is to take a small volume from this flask and subculture it into a new flask with fresh media, just like we saw with mammalian cells. This allows the bacterial cells to continue growing and dividing in the presence of new nutrients that were otherwise depleted in the old flask. Use one pre-sterilized pipette tip to transfer the liquid between the flasks. Leave the flasks open for as little time as possible and always work close to the Bunsen burner flame. Bacterial cultures are also used by scientists to store DNA and DNA plasmids. Most plasmids contain and express antibiotic resistance genes and adding specific antibiotics into the media will only allow bacteria carrying out plasmids of interest to grow overtly. In this case, the antibiotic is ampicillin. This also provides an extra level of control, but is not a replacement for good aseptic technique. Antibiotic resistance may arise through other mechanisms, and you may easily find yourself with contaminated cultures full of drug-resistant bacteria you don't want. Similar principles apply in mammalian cell culture. We can use antibiotics to select for cells expressing specific plasmids, and some scientists use penicillin, streptomycin, or penstrep to protect rare samples with very limited lifespan from unwanted infection. Ideally, avoid using selective agents as the default option if you can avoid it at all. Bacterial cultures then go onto shakers to optimize conditions for bacterial growth. As the flasks shake, the surface area for oxygen transfer between the air and liquid medium increases rapidly. And after a period of 24 hours on the shaker, you can see visible increase in the cloudiness or turbidity of the liquid E. coli broth. But just how much did this increase by and how many cells are we working with? There are a few different ways for us to measure cell density, total cell count, the turbidometric method, and viable cell count. Total cell count relies on pipetting cells onto a chamber slide and a hemocytometer, a device that contains counting chambers you can pipette a known volume of cells onto for visualizing under a microscope. Each square has a known surface area that can accommodate a specific volume of sample, and you can use this to calculate the number of cells per milliliter. In bacterial cells, this total cell count method is flawed. Their small size makes it difficult to count. Mammalian cells are bigger in size than bacterial cells, so we can also use tripan blue, to stain the cells first. Unlike living cells, dead cells will take up the dye and appear blue under the microscope. This step typically comes after resuspending cells from a flask in liquid media. At this point, you have more cells than you need for a single flask of subculturing. So counting the cells in a liquid suspension will make sure you're adding the right number of cells to the next flasks and plates. Transfer 100 microliters of cell suspension into a microfuge tube. Add 100 microliters of 0.4% tripan blue solution and mix by pipetting up and down.
A hemocytometer provides standardized viewing areas in the form of counting chambers that you can pipette cells onto. After cleaning with 70% ethanol, slide a cover slip over the chamber and gently pipette 10 microliters of your tripan blue stained cell suspension into the gap between the cover slip and the chamber. When looking at this under the microscope, you can see that the grid of the counting chamber is divided into nine squares. Each square has the same dimensions and contain a volume of 10 to the power of negative four milliliters. We can count the number of live, white, and dead blue cells in each square to estimate the cell concentration per mil in the suspension. First, let's calculate the percentage of viable cells. Divide the number of live cells by the total cell count, then multiply by 100. Next, let's calculate the number of viable cells per square. Divide the number of viable cells by the number of squares counted. Let's calculate the dilution factor, which is the final volume divided by the volume of cells. Our dilution factor is two because we added equal volumes of cell suspension and tripan blue, 100 microliters each. And finally, we can calculate the concentration of viable cells in our original cell suspension. Multiply the average number of viable cells per square by the dilution factor, then divide by the volume of a square, which is 10 to the negative four mils. Let's come back to bacterial cells. We're usually working with high cell density and the turbinometric method is a rapid technique that uses a spectrophotometer to measure light that is not scattered by the bacterial cells in a given sample. This is expressed as optical density or OD, typically at a wavelength of 600 nanometers. Load your sample into a cuvette along with a blank control sample. Both of these go into the spectrophotometer for the OD to be read. By themselves, the OD values don't mean much, but to convert an OD reading into the number of cells per mil, you will need to take these readings in tandem with viable cell counts. Perform a serial dilution of the bacterial culture and spread out a set volume of each dilution on separate agar plates. We can take an OD reading at the same time and cross-reference it with the number of colonies on each plate after incubation. We can only accurately count plates that have fewer than 300 colonies, but if you count enough plates, enough replicates, you can establish a standard curve converting OD to cells per mil for that particular bacterial strain with its specific growth rate in that nutrient media. Of course, cell growth could take a while to get started, and slow down as the cell numbers increase and nutrients are depleted. You then can interpolate using a straight line function. Given how quick and easy OD measurements are to obtain, it is still a great way of assessing cell density very quickly and non-invasively. This concludes part three of our series on cell and tissue culture. And in these videos, we cover resuscitating frozen cell stocks, subculturing cells, how the principles of aseptic techniques apply, and cell counting assays that allow you to carefully control your cell culture work. If you haven't seen parts one and two yet, you can find the links below. This is the Biolab Collective. I'm Jack Wayne, and I'll see you in the next video.